On this journey, we knew there would be surprises in store. We expected to meet new people and hear untold stories, to learn the truths behind the lore. Along the way, we discovered the hidden gems of Ireland. shoestring budget, working with what we had available to us at the time of filming. We are striving for improvements for better programming in the future. From the moment we arrived in Balladrine Island, there was never a dull moment. From Spellman's Motel to the abandoned convent, the week was full of surprises. We even got to go to the Cave of the Morgan, also known as Cave of the Cats. Spellman's Motel a staple in Balladrine was not limited to mystery and paranormal activity, as we came to realize very quickly, to whispers, to unknown phantom footsteps in the halls, to attachments. Well, we got to experience it all. I think one of our favorite captures of all was at Moore Hall. Mick's camera was being affected by something he was having all sorts of trouble. Then suddenly, without warning, his cell phone light comes on, flips, and gets thrown out. And then the people of Balladrine, who welcomed us into their historic homes, gave us the history on their wonderful town, shared their family stories and relics, personal belongings, and corrected us on the history of their land and their people for us to bring back and share with everybody. Vanessa and I feel so blessed and honored that they took the time to share all of that with us. Even at our departure, it was as magical as the previous week, as the ravens, the birds of the Morgan, bid their goodbyes. It was with a heavy heart, it was time for us to leave from Balladrine off to Dublin. It would be anywhere from a three to a little over a three hour ride, but we didn't mind. It was gonna be very scenic and we enjoyed every moment of it. We were very excited as we were gonna meet our friends, Lorna and David, as they flew in from Scotland just a couple of days before. We all finally got to meet up and decided to take in the sights and have a blether, as Lorna would say, before we went to our ultimate destination. We met you in Dublin, and we had already been in Ireland for eight days. We had already walked a little over 800 miles total. Mm -hmm. uh, we were mentally, physically emotionally whooped by this yeah. point but we weren't leaving ireland until we saw you guys Exciting. it just wasn't going to happen so you guys <laughs> flew in <laughs> you guys flew in from scotland and we all met up in dublin our last night that we were going to be there um we, we so, sort of holiday beforehand so we, we got a couple of days in dublin ourselves as well which was really nice oh yeah it's always good to get away hmm. um yeah but the, the plan was just to hang out for the day, maybe do like a lunch, brunch, um, go take in a few sites. And uh, after we were walking around, um, you guys had already been to a couple of places that Vanessa and I wanted to go to. 
one in particular uh, is a location that I feel everybody, if you ever go to Dublin, this is a location, I don't care what your belief system is, I feel you really need to go. Absolutely. It is a fascinating place with a fascinating history. And the mere fact that it's still there after all this time and after the things that have happened um, to the structure I, is, is unbelievable. And um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to let you take it from here and kind of <laughs> introduce what this place is to the people watching and give a little bit of history to it. Yeah, um, I'm, I'm a bit of an amateur historian. If there's anything that I can find out about stuff in the past, I am right there. And um, But you do such a good job at it. <laughs> <laughs> and um, I, I, I've got a very, very foggy brain because of my own little um, inconvenience, shall we say. <laughs> so um, I, I tend to write stuff down so that I've got it so that I can go and look at it because nine times out of ten about a week after I've looked at it I've forgotten about it I know that I've looked at stuff but I can't remember what I looked at so please bear with me because I have got some notes here <laughs> that's fine that's fine right so what we're trying what we are talking about is we're talking about Christchurch Cathedral in Dublin which is just it's it's a beautiful beautiful building and um, what I was able to find out was it was originally a Viking church. So it is as far back as the Vikings. Um, they reckon it was founded in around 1028. And the earliest manuscript to date it is actually dated 1030. And it's also the older of the two medieval churches in Dublin, the other one being St Patrick's, which I didn't get to only got to Christchurch. Um, so when it was originally built, it was built in wood and it was founded by, and I hope I've got this right, Siegtrig Silkbeard. Um, and he was the Herbenio, Herbe, High Bernio, sorry, put my teeth back in. <laughs> the, the High Bernio Danish King of Dublin. So there was still a lot of Viking influence there and you know, you had the, by, the, by the sounds of things, you, you had, it was like a cross between the Vikings and the Irish there. Um, if anyone out there thinks I'm wrong, please correct me. Um, and then what I was able to find was it was wee snippets after that, because, I, you know, I was saying to you the other day there, there's some places and you can get just tons and tons and tons of information. And then there's other places where you just get like wee snippets and all I could get was wee snippets and it seemed to be the same all the way through. So um, one really, really interesting thing um, was in 1171, King Henry of England attended the Christmas service there. And it is recorded that this was the first time that Henry received Holy Communion following the murder of Thomas Beckett. Ah. Do you know who Thomas Beckett is? I recall seeing the name. I want to yeah. say probably on some of the transcripts or some some of the things that they yep. had around there thomas beckett was the was a very close friend of king henry the second and in in a nutshell basically um the church of canterbury the bishop of canterbury oh so is this like the 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 uh the yeah. canterbury tales no kind it, of but Okay, is so, it like within that time frame? It, it's no, it's it's no. The Canterbury Tales is a wee bit later on, if I okay. remember rightly. This is still this is like eleven seventy one, so this is just over a hundred years since the Battle of Hastings to try and give you a timeline. Oh wow! So, Battle of Hastings ten sixty six. This okay. Well, this date him going to Christchurch is eleven seventy one. The next thing I came about was Strongbow. Yes. Everybody, Strongbow. Yes. Who um, in the UK people when they hear um, the name Strongbow think of a cider, right? 
Bitty, bitty, that was the bitty. first thing I thought of when I saw <laughs> the tomb was the Strongbow Cider um, commercials that we would see in the States. <laughs> David and I did it well, to be really honest with you. So anyway, so we're moving on to the Strong, um, Strongbow now, and he was actually called Richard de Clare, and he was the second Earl of Pembroke. And he became associated with the cathedral in round about 1180 when he and some other Norman magnates helped to fund a complete rebuild of the wooden church. So that's when the church moved from wood to stone. Okay. So we were starting to see some of the structure that you see today. Um, he was a medieval Norman peer and it was his arrival that marked the start of the Anglo-Norman involvement in Ireland. And he then went on to become King of Lynn in 1171. So he became very powerful in Ireland in his own right. Um, and he is buried in the cathedral nave, as we know. But um, when, his, when the nave collapsed in 1562, his tomb was smashed and it is actually a replacement tomb that you see today. His tomb was actually used as the venue for legal arrangements between the 16th and 18th centuries. So if you had any like legal work or any legal agreement that you had to get notarised or you wanted to agree with someone, you met at the tomb in Strombow and you did it there. Oh, wow. Yes. So yes. Yeah, so um, he 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 is the only king that's buried there. Because oh. um, okay. as far as I find, I could be wrong. <laughs> that's interesting. But, yep. He he is he's the only sort of king kingly person that I I could find. Fifteen sixty two. That's when all the fun happened, because the foundation of the nave slipped because they were built in peat. Apparently, you don't build things on peat that are particularly big. Um, horrible things happen. Yes. And brought down <laughs> a wall and a roof, obviously down on top of poor Strongbow's grave. And um, and um, partial repairs were done at that point. And unfortunately, by the start of the 19th century, uh, the building was declared unsafe and could no longer be accessed. It just been left to kind of wow. fizzle out. Um, and it wasn't until 1871 that the renovations that you see today started to take place. So it was the Victorians that got stuck into bringing it up. So I suppose that means that there's bits of that church and while they are absolutely gorgeous and in the Gothic style, it'll be the Victorian interpretation of right. what the, the Gothic style should be, which, as we know, the Victorians were very good at making up their own version of things. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. So that's about the the sort of main body of the church, because then you go down into, and you know what I'm going to say next, we go down into the most amazing place ever, the crypt. Yes. Um, and the crypt, they reckon, was constructed between 1172 and 1173. And it is the largest cathedral crypt in Britain or Ireland, um, measuring 63.4 metres long. And it is, it's very long, it's quite narrow. But it yes. Is, it's very, very long. Um, and it's um, it's now full of um, their, their exhibitions and the bookshop and there's some beautiful memorials up in the vault. People are obviously buried down there. And um, it is um, there within the library of the church that they hold a 14th century copy of the Magna Carta, um, wow. which um, has been on display. Um, I don't think I got to see it. I think it was just a little bit too busy, which I am a bit annoyed about because it was one of the reasons why we went there was because I would see the Magna Carta, especially after seeing the Book of Kells, which just blew my mind. But um, <laughs> um, the 
the other thing um, is that the church, even though it is seen as a Protestant church, it does have a relic, usual because relics tend to be from the Catholic faith. But because Church of Ireland, even though it is classed as Protestant, it's got Catholic leanings. So that would explain why they've still got a um, relic. <laughs> yes. And um, it's the heart of, and here we go, here's me trying to pronounce something in Irish again. I do apologise. Uh, Lercan Ua Tuthail, who is St. Lawrence O'Toole. And I know there's a story about the heart being stolen, but I didn't really get into time because I knew by this point in my notes I was really, really waffling. But there is a story about the heart being stolen and obviously it being recovered. And then um, there's just two other wee facts that... Um, I wanted to give you and one of them was that the crypt and the main body of the church were used during the filming of the Tudors. Yes. So um the you know and I've I've been watching the Tudors again quite recently and I can actually see the bits that they've used it for. So they, they've used it for whenever they're doing a, like a Catholic mass. Mm. Um they use the organ. Yes. Um, that the, the gorgeous organ. huge organ <laughs> which I do have pictures of and I'll be sharing in the episode but it's massive the last thing about Christchurch which I loved watching while you guys were in the church was the labyrinth yes. and this, this is a beautifully carved labyrinth that is actually out in the courtyard and um, we were we were talking about this other day there because we couldn't we couldn't quite remember why um, it was there, but there there were people there were people walking it. There were people who were just walking across that didn't know it was there, but there were people who were actually walking the labyrinth. And the reason why it's called a labyrinth, if I remember rightly, is because there's only one path through it. Whereas mm -hmm. with a maze, you've got lots of different options. So I was able to find out that. Um, it's it's used as a spiritual tool, um, and it's used for centering your activity. And you walk it. You, you should be walking the labyrinth, the labyrinth in a form of meditation, and be walking the path of the labyrinth. The spirit finds healing and wholeness. Now that to me translates as that isn't just about the Christian religion. Anyone of any religion could use that, and yes. it was lovely to see because were pilgrims around and you would see some people that obviously had a faith who mm -hmm. were walking it and some of them did it quite quickly some of them did it quite slowly but you could see by the time they got to the middle of the labyrinth that beautiful knotwork that's in the middle of it you could see how the, the effect it had on them yes and then of course you had the kids who just saw it as a fun game and were running oh yeah <laughs> And also looking down into the bit of the, the, the exposed part of the crypt. Yes. That is well, which is closed off because it is it's it's just so fragile now. Um yes, and it. I can't remember the date for that, but it makes me think that maybe the crypt area and I could be this is just me thinking, um, I think that the crypt could actually be bigger than they think it is, but Oh, I have a sneaky <laughs> suspicion that the crypt area, because like you were saying, when you're walking towards the cathedral, um, I, I do have photos and all that I'm, I'm going to share within this episode um, of it's an exposed crypt area, like you were saying, and it's a good size area. And, you know, like you said, you, you know, they have it quarantined all, you know, corded off and all. You can't get down in there, but it's open so you can get pictures and all. It's a good size area. It makes me wonder how many more of those are mm -hmm. all around that entire block or blocks, if you will. Oh, uh, I'm fairly certain that there's many more that haven't been exposed that are laying around there quite quite possibly you know when you look at edinburgh and you've got the because edinburgh is basically a city that's built on top of a city that's built on top of a city mm -hmm. and, you know, so there's and you know what they found in york as well 
and things that they found in Dublin with the Viking era as well. You know, there there must be other things under there. But obviously, you know, you can understand them not wanting to maybe go and dig it all up. You know, the grounds are beautiful, you know. I oh, think yes. I was upset. <laughs> oh, yes. So you're in, uh, uh, in, in Ireland, you're in Dublin. You can't leave until you actually go to a pub. You have to go to a pub. Yeah. So we do. Yes. A lovely meal. It was lovely. Until. <laughs> Things got real weird. What I thought at first was just, it was, at first I thought it was just hysteria from just being so tired and so emotional <laughs> and just, just, just done in. And um, so I offered to get a coffee. And um, so I went and got her coffee and sat it down in front of her. And she got very, very excited at the fact that there was two chocolate digestive biscuits with the coffee. And it, it, was, it was almost as if she was drunk, but she hadn't actually drunk any alcohol. And she, not a drop. Not a drop. And she, she started laughing. And putting her head down on the table and then looking up. And then she'd take one look at me and she just burst out laughing again and down in the table. And like we were like, Yeah, that's it. Vanessa's had enough. She needs to go home. You know, it's, it's, it's gone too much for her. And then all of a sudden she put her hands on the table and looked up right at me. And her pupils were huge. Now I know that we were in quite a dark area, mm-hmm. but even for that. Her pupils were huge, absolutely huge. And she looked at me and she went, I can hear you. I can't see you. At which point, you and I looked at one another. Yeah. And went, that not Netta. Uh, <laughs> That's yeah. <a> minute. <laughs> yeah. We knew. We knew something was up. Because Ooh. when she did that. Mm-hmm. And I immediately, I just kind of looked at her and mm-hmm. I looked over at you and you were already looking over at me. And um, I believe that's when I started grabbing her because I was already, already reaching for some of my stuff out of my bag. Yes. And I was grabbing her on her elbow and I was tugging her and you were like, Vanessa, um, don't you want to go out for a cigarette? And she's like, oh, and she's just going on and on and on. And I'm like, yeah, come on. Come on, Van. We need to go outside for a cigarette. Mm-hmm. And I was and tugging and tugging. I am an ex-smoker, so I am not going to recommend to someone to go outside and have a cigarette. But <laughs> at that point, it was it was necessary, folks. You had to get out of there. Um, because I knew there was a, a significant, we knew there was a significant attachment. And something was about to go down. And I really needed to get her away from as many people as possible. Mm -hmm. Um, It's like I, because Vanessa and I have shared this experience with other people. And I tell people the best way I can describe it is if you've watched the movie Practical Magic. And the scene where they're all... um, the where they're all sitting around the table drinking the margaritas and they're they're all like kind of like yelling stuff out and they're like ah oh, you know they're like they don't know where it's coming from and they're like where did this vodka come from and the aunts are like someone left it on the porch or something like that yep. that was the first thing that I thought of when she did that I can hear was it I can hear you but I can't see you it That scene from the movie was the, I don't know why, but that was the first thing that hit me. And I was like, oh, shit. (laughs) (laughs) I'm like, oh, no. I don't know who you are, but you got to go. (laughs) You are not going back to the States with us. You didn't pay for no ticket. You stay in here. (laughs) So I grab her and she's all, while I'm trying to get her out the pub, of course, it's a pub. It's crowded. Mm-hmm. So we're kind of bumping into people. She's like, hey. And I'm like, Vanessa, come on. 
she's like really friendly with everybody and i'm like more so than normal okay <laughs> and i'm like come on vanessa and everyone's like you know kind of looking at her i'm like she's just, i'm just trying to air you know come on vanessa so i get her outside and we we had it you had to go through like like a little corridor thing and we go outside and i get her back to the wall mm-hmm. because i want to make sure she couldn't get away from me mm-hmm. okay um because we've all seen how she phew, will take off when she's communicating and when something takes over her so yeah, last thing i needed was for her to take off running in front of traffic in the middle of dublin Mm-mm. Mm-mm. no no that would not be good so i had her back against the wall and i had a little one of the little um dram vials of mm. some oil that i had made some sage oil it was one of the few things that i was able to grab quickly mm-hmm. and i had her wrist and i was holding her against the wall and we were like face to face and i'm pretty sure some folks were looking at us like we were absolutely nuts and they probably thought she was just drunk and that I was just a friend trying to get her to settle down. And I put her, I hold her wrist down. And the whole time I'm holding her wrist down, I'm taking my one hand. Good thing I was a cop and knew how to handle handcuffs with one yeah. hand. Because I'm taking this dram bottle and I'm like getting the top off of it while I'm holding her wrist down. And I'm getting the top on. And I drop the top. And I'm just like soaking her wrist down as hard as I can. And the whole time I'm doing both of her wrists now, I'm like switching the bottle back and forth. And I'm like eye to eye with her. And I'm like, I don't know who you are. I don't know what you're doing, but you need to go. You need to leave my friend. I I need Vanessa back. And she just looks at me. Doesn't say anything, but just... (laughs) the most maniacal laugh and grin and I just start ringing on the wrist start grinding that oil in and then I start taking it and just start rubbing it on the head on her forehead and she's like turning her head away from me I'm like you need to go this goes on for a few minutes Mm -hmm. all of a sudden all the color comes back to her face her pupils go back to normal Mm -hmm. her eyes kind of roll around and she goes And she looks and she looks around and I said, and she looks at me, she goes, how, how do we get out here? And I looked at her, I said, what's the safe word? Because we have a safe word. She gave me the safe word. And I said, my God, woman. And she's like, what happened? So I told her, as I was telling her, there was two young ladies that worked at the pub that we were all in. They were out having a smoke break. Well, they were witnessing this. And they came over and asked if Vanessa was okay. And we were like, yeah, um, I know that was weird. (laughs) And sorry you had to kind of witness that. And Vanessa was like, I'm a psychic medium and I got jumped by something. And then she starts describing a Mm -hmm. man, an individual. And starts describing an injury, talking about his head and everything. And she was like, who got killed here that looks like this and this happened to him? Well, the other one, one of the young ladies had to go back in because her break was over. The other young lady is standing there talking to us. And while Vanessa's explaining all of this, the young lady just gets this look on her face. And she says, um, that wasn't here, but... That happened at a pub right down the block that I used to work at. She said, I know who you're talking about. I know what happened. And I was like, wow. And she said, so what you're just telling me, that was him that was doing all of that. And I was like, yeah, I said, did you see, you know, I was like, did you see the way she was looking at me, the way she was smiling? I was like, that wasn't her. She said, no, that would have been him. She said, cause he was, he was mean. He was mean. 
Mm-hmm. And I was like, yeah, well, he's going to stay here because he ain't going <laughs> with us. <laughs> <You know? laughs> it was. By that point, you had come out. Yes. We've been out there for a little bit. Yes. And you had come out there. And I think you even made the comment. You were like, okay, she's back. Uh-huh. <laughs> as soon as you looked at her. <laughs> it was. <laughs> it was scary because. Mm-hmm. I never had to take an attachment off. With, out in an uncontrolled environment. With that many bystanders around. Because. Had it gone out of control I really don't know what I would have done mm-hmm. I would yeah. have been screwed mm-hmm. I was but, terrified I was terrified but I had to let this thing know mm-hmm. you know you gotta go I, I I was terrified but I couldn't let it know that yep yeah, but at least now you know that if it happens again you can take control in a busy situation like that yeah i just hope it doesn't happen again. <laughs> what we have displayed right now are examples of a non-attachment to the left the center photo is an attachment that she had at spellman's you can tell by the eyes it is that of a child the picture to the right is a photo that lorna had taken inside the pub before I got Vanessa outside. That was the attachment that we could see. We spent eight days in Ireland, the last day being in Dublin, and it was fantastic. We hope to return again sometime where we would be able to spend more time and learn even more of this fascinating island and its people.